Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the PDS Solutions Incorporated conference call to discuss the company's financial results for the fourth quarter and the full year ended December 31, 2019. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, for which instructions will be given at that time. If you need assistance during the conference, please press star then zero on your touchstone telephone. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Joe Diaz of Lithum Partners. You may begin. Thank you, Operator, and thanks to all of you for participating on today's call. We appreciate your time and your ongoing interest in PDF solutions. As the Operator indicated, my name is Joe Diaz. I'm a managing partner at Lithum Partners. We're the investor relations consulting firm for PDF. With us on the call today are John Kabarian, President and Chief Executive Officer of PDF Solutions, Kim and Michaels, Co-Founder and Executive Vice President, and Christine Russell, Chief Financial Officer. If you have not yet received a copy of today's press release, it is available at the company's website at www.pdf.com. Before we begin with prepared remarks, please be aware that some of the statements that will be made during the course of this conference call are forward-looking within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, including statements regarding PDF's future financial results and performance, growth rates, and demand for its solutions. PDF's actual results could differ materially. You should refer to the section entitled Risk Factors on PDF's annual report on Form 10-K for the fiscal year ended December 31, 2018, and similar disclosures in subsequent SEC filings. The forward-looking statements and risks stated on this conference call are based on information available to PDF today. The company assumes no obligation to update them. Now I'd like to introduce John Kabarian, PDF Solutions President and Chief Executive Officer, who will be followed by Christine Russell, Chief Financial Officer. John, please proceed. Thank you for joining us on today's call. If you've not already seen our earnings press release and management report for the fourth quarter and full year, please go to the investor section of our website where each has been posted. As we head into 2020, I believe we start the new decade with clear and focused strategy and the potential for significant revenue growth and bottom line results. We continue to make progress on our evolution to become the leading analytics company focused on delivering improved process efficiency and product reliability to the global semiconductor supply chain. Going forward, our focus will be to grow our analytics business where we can increasingly deliver our solutions via the cloud to generate consistent recurring revenue at a higher gross margin that will bring increased level of profitability to our revenue. Today's press release started reporting two revenue components, analytics, and Integrated Yield Ramp, or IYR. IYR composes of revenue from our engagements that include performance-based incentives on customers' yield achievement, such as gain share royalties. Analytics complies all other revenue, including from our Accenture software DFI and characterization vehicles without performance-based incentives. We believe this, that reporting revenue in this manner will provide you with better visibility into the business. The financial results of 2019 reflect our ongoing transition to predominantly analytics business. For the quarter and for the full year, analytics comprised 60% and 58% of total revenue, respectively. It's worth noting that Q4 2019 analytics revenue grew 31% compared with Q4 2018, and full year 2019 analytics revenue grew 29% compared to 2018. These results are in line with our financial our internal expectations as we de-emphasize the yield ramp business. We are pleased with the progress achieved to this point and look forward to greater momentum in the coming years. We believe that some of the momentum will continue to come from getting the more than 130 Accenture customers, most of whom use only one Accenture module, for example, manufacturing analytics, to use more, more of the additional modules available on the highly robust Accenture platform, for example, test operations, assembly operations, or artificial intelligence. Additionally, 
significant momentum will come from moving these customers to our cloud offering. In 2019, we undertook a number of pilots with key existing customers to achieve these goals. In the latter half of 2019, we started to see initial results. For example, in the third quarter, an IDM customer added Accenture online test control to its existing offline analytics, resulting in, gro in a growth of our annual recurring revenue from this customer of more than 10x to the run rate in just a few years. We also had a number of pilots with major customers in 2019 utilizing our artificial intelligence solutions, and the initial results are encouraging. For further example, in 2019, we completed three cloud pilots and we anticipate those customers moving to Accenture deployments to PDF's cloud offering in the first half of 2020. These customers will be able to leverage the big data module of Accenture, which offers an 8x improvement in loading and retrieval times and a 40x improvement in, data, in database computation. The annual recurring revenue of our cloud deployments is typically more than 2x the ARR of our customers who install Accenture on-premise. PDF is the number one commercial solution for manufacturing yield and control because we are the only commercial analytics-focused provider with the breadth and scale required by our customers. We have a global demanding and cutting-edge customer base, which includes the leading Fabulous, Foundry, IDMs, OSATs, and system companies. No more than 25% of our sales is from any one international market, which helps, us, which helps, which helps to insulate us somewhat from localized events such as the current coronavirus pandemic. While we have an office in the affected area, our employees are able to work remotely and our global workforce is able to support customers wherever located. We hope the spread of the virus is contained and those affected recover quickly. Luckily, we do not see a significant impact on our business from the virus in the foreseeable future. Over the years, we have made a number of acquisitions and investments to expand our offerings to address manufacturing challenges of customers building products with mature notes, in addition to our capability in aiding customers on advanced notes. As a result, we have a suite of software designed for the continued more than more environment, which represents a growth opportunity for us. Further, semiconductor companies are increasingly accepting and adopting cloud-based software which can more effectively process the increased data volumes they generate. Our customers need their information flow seamless and efficiently. We are the only end-to-end -end analytics software provider in this space capable of delivering that, this accelerated level of performance, and we believe that once our analytics software is integrated within a customer's operation, it will stay in place for an extended period of time. In 2019, our customer retention rate was over 95%. This stickiness will provide greater predictability to our financial and operational results on a quarterly and annual basis. Throughout PDF's transition to an analytics company, including in 2019, we have managed expenses, invested in our future, and overall generated cash to maintain a solid financial foundation for the company. In 2019, the company generated over $24 million in cash from operations, and as of December 31st, we have cash and equivalents in the neighborhood of $100 million with zero long-term debt. We believe our balance sheet provides the necessary drive power to continue to grow our analytics business, both organically and with strategic acquisitions. Our stock repurchase programs have taken approximately $50 million in shares out of the market since 2014. Our continuing stockholder support has allowed us to go into 2020 in a leading position, and we look forward to upcoming opportunities to continue to grow our business. As you may have seen yesterday, we announced that Christine will step down as CFO after we file our 10K, and Adnan Raza will take over as Chief Financial Officer. We really appreciate the leadership Christine has brought to the PDF, and we're sure the best as she focuses on contributing to the industry via board participation. We are very excited to have Adnan Raza join us. A number of months ago, Adnan began consulting for us on a number of matters. Through that period, we got to appreciate his quick mind, deep thinking, and collaborative work style. When the opportunity arose, Kim and I both thought PDF would be enriched with him as our next CFO. Over the next few weeks, as we meet with many of you, we will take that time to introduce Adnan to you all. 
For today, I'd like to turn the call over to Christine for a review of the numbers, after which we will open the call to your questions. Christine? Thank you, John. Most of you will have seen our financials in our earnings release. In addition, we've posted a management report in the Investor Relations section of our website. The report has financials and comments regarding the results of PDF for the quarter and year, so I'll focus my comments on a few key areas. All of the financial results that we provide on this call are on a non-GAAP basis, which excludes stock-based compensation, amortization of intangibles, and restructuring charges. Please refer to our press release for our GAAP results and GAAP to non-GAAP reconciliation. As John mentioned, starting with our fourth quarter and year-end financial results, we began reporting our revenue as analytics and integrated yield ramp. IYR reporting comprises revenue from our engagements that include performance incentives based on customers' yield achievement, such as gain share royalty. Analytics reporting comprises all other revenue, including from our Accensio software platform, Design for Inspection Solution, DFI, and Characterization Vehicle Solutions. We believe this presentation provides our investors better insight into our business and the path ahead in the coming years. Our former revenue reporting segments were solutions, which included all product and services revenues, and gain share, which represented our royalty revenues. Fourth quarter total revenues of $22.6 million was up 3% sequentially. In general, revenues were as we anticipated, given that our model is still in an evolution towards analytics. In the fourth quarter, analytics was the majority of total revenues at 60%. We'll continue to be very selective and strategic in generating future IYR business that can contribute to our top and bottom line results. Although we expect to generate IYR revenue for a number of years going forward, primarily as a result of gain share royalty payments for legacy engagements, looking ahead to 2020 and beyond, our expectation for IYR revenue is that it will be lumpy quarter to quarter with a gradual decrease over the next several years as we focus on our analytics business. We expect continued growth in our analytics business, although there may be quarters where the revenue growth in analytics is offset by variable IYR revenue results. Now, let's turn to cost to sales and gross margin. Non-GAAP gross margins were 64% during the fourth quarter compared to 55% in the year ago fourth quarter. On a dollar basis, Q4 gross margins were 14.4 million compared to the same period a year ago, which was 10.9 million. Non-GAAP cost to sales for the fourth quarter was $8.1 million compared to $8.8 million in the same period a year ago. The reduction in cost of sales is a result of the increasing software component of our sales, which is less expensive to deliver than a complete integrated yield ramp solution. As we continue to build the revenue contribution from software, SaaS, and subscription sales, we expect gross margins to continue to expand subject to the quarterly variability inherent in IYR. Ultimately, we expect to achieve our target margins of more than 70%. During the fourth quarter, we entered into an agreement with TIBCO Software that extends a collaboration to embed and customize Spotfire in our Accensio Analytics platform. The agreement provides that PDF will continue to use TIBCO Spotfire tools for AI-powered visualization for our analytics product line, as well as adding the capability of TIBCO EBX for master data management. This creates a powerful combination of software to provide advanced lifecycle product analytics for our customers. With the TIBCO software embedded with PDF software, we solve the problem of silos of data which only provide local optimization. By integrating the data and applying AI and ML, we can provide foresight across the entire production process, reducing the time it takes to make critical decisions that drive higher product yield, quality, and reliability. The agreement extends the collaboration, which began back in 2010 by up to another decade. We expect to amortize this prepaid license over the term of the agreement. In the fourth quarter of 2019, the true up to round out the prior agreement and a partial quarter amortization was $260,000.
the upfront cash payment will be made in Q1. Now let's look at our operating expenses, which were up 6% sequentially at $13.1 million for an increase of $700,000 quarter over quarter. R&D expense increased by approximately $300,000, primarily due to our investment in analytics R&D hiring related to our cloud and AI offerings to prepare for strong deployment of AI and cloud in the first half of 2020. SG&A increased by almost $400,000 as a result of one-time expenses, including our October user conference and analyst day for $200,000 and audit fees for the end of year. We also incurred approximately $100,000 of expense for patent filings pertaining to the analytics business as we expanded our patent portfolio with additional DFI patents and machine learning and related technologies. Bottom line, we posted non-GAAP net profit of $1.1 million. Non-GAAP earnings per share in the quarter was $0.03. Cents. Shares outstanding for Q4 were $32.4 million. Now we'll turn our attention to the balance sheet. Cash at the end of Q4 was $97.6 million, a $2.7 million decrease from the prior quarter. The primary use of cash during Q4 was $2.8 million for CapEx for DFI eProbe solution. Our strong balance sheet continues to provide a solid foundation for opportunistically executing acquisitions and funding organic growth. Turning to the full year 2019, it was a year in which we became a predominantly analytics company. Total revenues in 2019 were $85.6 million compared to 2018 revenue of $85.8 million. In 2018, the revenue segmentation was 45% analytics and 55% IYR. In 2019, it flipped to 58% analytics and 42% IYR. This is year-over-year -year growth in analytics revenue of 29%, beating the target we discussed at our user conference and analyst day of 20% annual analytics revenue growth. IYR revenue declined by 24% compared to 2018. This is as we expected, and it resulted in flat year-over-year -year total revenue performance. The IYR category includes engagements with both fixed fees and gain share, with gain share now the majority component which contributes to variability. With analytics revenue now the predominant component of our total revenues, we're benefiting from the increasing annual recurring revenue that provides better visibility looking forward. ARR primarily includes software and DFI and characterization vehicle time-based licenses, as well as support and maintenance contracts. ARR grew by close to 20% from 2018 to 2019. We have seen a continuous trend in increasing ARR going back to 2014. In fact, since 2014, ARR has quadrupled. As expected, non-GAAP gross margins increased from 55% in 2018 to 65% in 2019. The predominance of analytics revenue in 2019, which commands more software-like margins, drove the gross margin expansion. As we mentioned at our user conference and analyst day, we are ultimately targeting 70% or better gross margins. Operating expenses increased in 2019 from 2018 by 13%. During the year, we invested in additional hires in R&D in the analytics part of the business as we continue to focus on expansion of the offering. Greater than 50% of our operating expenses consist of new product development and deployment. Turning to SG&A, during 2019, we hired directors of marketing and business development to focus on accelerating the growth in our analytics business through events, brand awareness, and strategic alliances. We also incurred additional expenses in connection with legal actions to compel a slow-paying Asia customer to pay contractual fees due, of which $7.7 .7 million was successfully collected before year-end. We posted a non-GAAP profit of $4.5 million in 2019, or $0.14, cents, compared to a non-GAAP profit of $2.8 million, or $0.09 cents in 2018. Our 2019 ending cash balance of $97.6 million increased by $1.5 million compared to the prior year. 
During the year, we generate $25 million cash from operations and use $12 million of that cash to repurchase stock, $3 million for acquisition-related expense, and the remainder for CapEx. In summary, during 2019, we became primarily an analytics company. We've put the components in place to drive revenue, expand margins, and maintain an exceptional balance sheet. And finally, I've greatly enjoyed working with PDF and all of you, and I hope our paths cross again in the future. We'll now turn the call over to the operator for questions. Operator? And now we're ready to take questions. To ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And we have a question on queue from John Ten Wanteng from CJS Securities. Your line is now open. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my questions. Hi, John. Um, John, can you talk about the coronavirus impact on your Chinese businesses and, and prospects in the near term? I know you said you don't expect it to have a significant impact, but is that just a timing thing? Are you seeing a slowdown now and expect it to pick back up later? Um, in that context, uh, has there been any um, change in the you know timing of, of signings or um, uh, gain share through Q1 so far. Any color or context would be appreciated. Thank you. Sure, John. Yeah, so I think there's, you know, obviously a couple of layers to what's going on in China. First of all, our, our Chinese national customers, we have been working with them. Many of them we are uh, working with them with our folks remotely, but we, we see vehicles continuing to run, t data being tested and analyzed, and we continue to engage with them, primarily for the customers that are outside of uh, the Wuhan area. We know our software is being used at factories uh, all around uh, the country, and our cloud-based offering there is continuing to be used, and we continue to engage with customers primarily uh, remotely, though. Um, then we also have uh, uh, international customers who have significant operations in China as well. And uh, for those customers, we have less direct access to those facilities. They're mostly uh, assembly and test facilities at this point. Our software runs in those facilities with less of our uh, insight about what's going on. Places where we run vehicles, we tend to know a little bit more about what's going on. However, um, I would say that the multinationals are slower to bring back up their facilities than some of the local companies. That said, we don't really uh, foresee at this time uh, a substantial uh, impact in our business. Uh, our customers tell us that they will be more back to full steam as we get into the next few weeks. And we continue, even on contracting, having contracting discussions with our uh, customers in that location. You know, obviously it's a very uh, um, dynamic situation, so, you know, things can change that we don't foresee at this point. But we, we see the customers over there being very, very resilient and finding ways to continue to maintain activity, and we are trying to support them the best way we can. Great. Thanks for the color. And then um, it, could you talk a little bit more about the traction with the eProbe and DFI products, and if you have any updates on the Series 250 performance and um, any updates on expectations for more shipments this year, perhaps to you know the same or, or different clients? Sure. Yeah, so we, um, we uh, extend the customer. Uh, we have a customer, one existing machine we extend this year, and uh, in a customer, and we began in the second half of 2019 a paid pilot with a second customer, uh, taped out that vehicle at the end of 2019, and expect those wafers to come to our facility in the first part of this year. We also had another uh, pilot going on with another leading edge logic company. So at this point, we're engaged with three leading edge logic manufacturers um, for uh, DFI capability, virtually all looking for the same uh, benefits. We uh, anticipate as we get through this year to uh, have uh, expanded uh, activities inside those facilities, so shipping machines, at a combination of those customers. Exactly, you know, we have a limited capacity on what we could ship, so exactly where it goes to who first and when is hard for me to predict right now. Okay, great. And then any, any color on what GainShare uh, did in the quarter? I don't know if you um, released that at all and kind of if there is any commentary around that. It was, um, it was primarily 14 nanometer gain share, and it was comparable to what we see typically in Q4s over the past few years. Okay, thanks. Um, just looking at the SGNA line, you mentioned there was a 
couple of one times costs in there, Christine. Are, are those, does that mean SGNA will come down in Q1 as we uh, come through out of Q4? Well, there are some permanent costs and there are some uh, one-time costs. First of all, hiring a uh, director of uh, marketing and business development will be ongoing, you know, especially as we, we uh, pursue the analytics business. That really is what you need to, uh, you know, put wood behind your arrow to grow the uh, business. So, so that part of the cost will continue. Obviously, the uh, user conference is a one-time thing. Uh, the uh, patent filings are part of GNA, and so those will be ongoing. So I would say uh, I would, you know, I would be thinking about uh, SGNA as staying at about the level we are right now. Got it. Thank you. And then uh, just one more thing, uh, Christine Krajatz on, on moving on to whatever's next. Um, it, it wasn't clear. Are you going to be on the board of the company after that from the, the press release that said you're, you're going to be? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm on the board of three publicly traded companies, but not PDF. Got it. Okay, understood. And then, uh, John, what, what priorities will uh, Anand be having as CFO and kind of what, um, what, what, what made him interesting to, to you guys as a candidate? Sure. Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, you know, Anand had a very strong background uh, both on the operational side and before that on the banking side. Uh, as we've transitioned the business from being a Yale ramp business to being more and more the Accenture software platform, we uh, see ways that we can bring metrics in the way we run the day-to-day -day operation that are much more consistent with other software and SaaS entities. And uh, Adnan's strong analytic skills can help us with that, as well as the fact that every time we've made uh, kind of these tuck-in acquisitions, there's a number of additional benefits we're able to drive uh, in terms of expanding our footprint in the accounts, as well as connecting our customers. You know, uh, internally we say that uh, our first goal right now is to expand the landed accounts. We have 130 accounts, none of whom spend as much as they can with PDF, and so we're expanding that revenue. But as, we, um, as customers realize that a lot of their partners also use Accentios, we see lots of ways to collaborate. So M&A becomes uh, a way of us driving a larger and larger footprint in our accounts, and, and uh, Adnan's background in M&A will also help us there as well. Great. I, I do have one more, but I'll jump back in the queue, see if others uh, have questions first. Thanks, sir. Again, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone keypad. We have a question from Christian Schwab from Craig Hallam Capital. The line is now open. Great. Thanks for taking my question. I'm just wondering what, um, if you have any updates uh, r regarding uh, the IWAR business um, with, uh, with potential new customers in, in China and have, um, I, I know, you know, X the coronavirus, but it, it is, have we had increased dialogue there? Um, as different manufacturers begin to try to ramp up different technology nodes there, um, or is there nothing new to report? Um, no, actually, it's a good, uh, it's a good point, Christian. Uh, we have seen an increased dialogue in the second half of 2014 with a number of leading-edge logic manufacturers in China, um, and we anticipate in this first half of the year uh, converting some of those to licenses. You know, we know of a handful of companies all engaged on FinFET technology notes. Um, and so, uh, you know, when we go back to our own forecasting for the year, we're a little bit cautious on how much of that we forecast. Hence, part of our reason for saying we don't anticipate much impact is uh, most of those factories don't, are not in the affected area. Uh, and number two, we've been a little bit cautious about how we've uh, forecasted that into our bookings plan. Um, you know, I think as of now, I think our team is tracking something like four ongoing FinFET technologies, all of which we're engaged with at some level. So, you know, um, that's a lot for a single country. Right, right. right. Okay, great. Thanks. We've modeled it a little bit carefully. Okay, perfect. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. And we have a follow-up from John Tanwan Tang from CJS Security. So line is now open. 
Thank you. John, you usually run down the, the list of new deals or signings in, in the quarter. not sure if there's anything of note that you wanted to talk about, but um, maybe uh, more specifically, what, what are the expectations of um, projects or signings or, or licenses in your pipeline for 2020, whether it's, you know, a lot of deals from penetration of existing customers, you know, seeing you large engagements on your horizon or um, maybe, yeah. you know, new clients, you know, what are you looking forward to? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, as we've transitioned the business uh, with Accentio, the, the deal flow in a given quarter ends up becoming much larger, right? So well over 50 contracts signed in a quarter typically. And so I, we have very little, you know, so it's less to, it's harder to, so usually now I just select a few to tell a story rather than when it was primarily your end business and you could exhaustively describe the contract signed in a quarter and four or five bullets max. Um, and so uh, as we look into this year, as part of my prepared remarks, uh, we uh, have been, and part of the reason why we increased spending in Q4 is we completed a number of uh, cloud pilots with customers and we're told that they like the cloud performance. We anticipate those signing in the first half of this year and we expect to uh, expand our number of customers on the cloud. As I said, generally that means the ARR is well over 2x um, the run rate when they're on premise. Uh, at our user conference, we had had uh, one of the guest speakers was AWS, an executive from AWS, because a lot of our customers, we are uh, bringing them to the Accentio cloud that is on uh, Azure, uh, on AWS. We expect the first half of the audit to be a substantial part of uh, the bookings activity. Uh, moreover, we kept we completed a couple of AI deployments and the uh, pilots in the second half of 2019 and uh, already have approval from customers to roll out, at least one of the customers on a production rollout and anticipate the other as well. And we believe that will also drive um, substantial growth. So there's a number of what we call expand the landed accounts, accounts that have been PDF accounts, in some cases of 10 or 15 years, used either Accentio as point tools or were a Yale ramp customer where they're now looking at deploying Accentio on a platform basis. So, you know, that for the first half of the year, it's greatly those activities, some vehicles on a, uh, subscriptions for vehicles that we also see uh, in leading edge logic manufacturers uh, outside of uh, China. And then as Christian brought up, we do see some increased uh, yield ramp activity in China itself. With the uh, 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 activity on DFI, we anticipate uh, the extension of our our main customer this year, as well as expansion into additional customers as we get through this first half of the year, as we complete up the pilots that we're doing with them in this first uh, part of the year. Um, you know, so obviously we're generating revenue from those pilots already, but we'd like to get those machines, that machine going from our lab into their fab. Uh, so I think that kind of captures the majority of the activities that are going on. In part, that explains a little bit what uh, Christine discussed about our TIPCO spend. As we've deploying more and more with our customers, they start seeing the need of looking at uh, Accentio as their data lake or their overall data environment. Historically, Accentio has been a system the customers use for the data types that uh, PDF supports and installs, which is most engineering data in a fab. But we've now had customers wanting to load in financial data into Accentio, uh, product costing data and other data for newer modules. And so the extension with TIPCO allows them to load data in on demand, data that not, you know, they, we may not actually typically get uh, uh, access to, so they can do additional AI, AI activities. So um, we do see, as we get out in the second half of the year, opportunities to expand customers who start looking at Accentio as a data lake for them rather than just as a platform for all their engineering analysis. Great, thanks, John. Appreciate it. And our next question is from Gus Richard from Northland. Your line is now open. Yes, um, thanks for taking the question. Uh, in terms of gain share, um, you know, I think you have still a few big contracts. Um, you know, when when do those, um, you know, particularly 14 nanometer contracts roll off? How many more years do you have on them? Yeah, so um, uh, some of the early ones roll off over the next couple of years, and then there's others that are just starting up that will have many years past that. 
Okay, there there so are game share contracts that run out. I mean, primarily, once you get through the first half of the 2020s, so let's say you know, 2022 time frame, um, the majority of the non-Chinese uh, facilities roll off. And as you go from 2022 to 2030, primarily it's China and to a lesser extent Taiwan entities that will drive the majority of the game share. Got it. Thank you. And then um, in terms of sort of what you're thinking about in, in terms of M&A, you know, you did the Kinesis acquisition a while back. It was very uh, successful. Are you, um, you know, do you have a, a number of companies that you're looking at? Are you looking at, you know, more data sources? Can you just sort of give any color around what the, the M&A pipeline might look like? Sure, um, Garcia. There's, it's actually relatively robust. Um, the, there are additional data types typically outside of the fab at this point as we have most of the fab data types included in even most of the test and assembly data types. Um, so there are additional data types that we're looking at. Um, there are also, you know, what we've found, you know, if you look at uh, the Centricity acquisition, Centricity was a cloud-based yield management system that had a subset of functions that we had with Accentio's manufacturing analytics module. Um, but there were a handful of customers that were very reliant on uh, that product. When we acquired that and then integrated it, um, we were able to increase our footprint in those accounts because they needed some of the base capability that Accentio had. Yet, um, when you would go in and sell from the outside, they already had you know, deployed an existing product. So we do find sometimes consolidation of um, companies that are in the same uh, category as us helps us expand the revenue inside those accounts. You know, in my prepared remarks, I alluded to the fact that we're the only company that really has the scale. A lot of these companies tend to be smaller private entities. And uh, as, as these uh, semiconductor companies and system companies see manufacturing analytics as a strategic activity in their business, and I would say uh, many of the uh, CTOs, heads of manufacturing and CIOs I meet with, all say that digitization of the manufacturing is becoming a strategic activity. They need to have a supplier that they can actually count on. And so a lot of those companies are really kind of hit the end of their road in terms of what they're able to do for the customer. But the customer has a huge investment of that software being integrated into their facilities, just like our, our retention rate is quite high, their retention rate is also quite high. So by acquiring those companies, integrating their product onto the Accentio platform, we give a lot of these customers a path towards a greater platform without needing to rip up and replace the investment that those companies have made in those companies. So there's a lot of activity in little companies like that. Got it. And then, you know, I know this is a tough question. Can you uh, size the um, Extensio, your software, um, opportunity at this point and, and perhaps uh, venture a guess as to what the growth rate will be over the next few years? Yeah, so, you know, at our analyst day, we said that we anticipated the growth rate for the business to be uh, on the order of 20% a year. If you look at our analytics business this year, it grew at, uh, you know, over last year, it grew at 30, roughly 30%. And, um, you know, obviously, uh, that's really primarily driven by, uh, you know, extensive on the overall analytics business. So we anticipate, uh, you know, the growth rate staying very robust over these next few years for Accentio and the analytics business overall. Um, you know, in terms of what's the serviceable market, I believe we reported that in our analyst day as well. Uh, and, I, you know, um, actually off the top of my head, Gus, I don't remember the specific number. I remember being much larger than we are now. So, you know, uh, it's like the way I used to balance my checkbook. As long as I wrote checks much smaller than what I had in my checkbook, I was okay. Um, so I, I do see that we have quite a good runway in front of us for the analytics business overall. And as, as it's gotten larger, as I alluded to in the Collaborate, we see ways that, you know, we think over time the business opportunity will expand as customers will start relying on analytics more and more to control their manufacturing. Right. Okay. And then last one for me, um, you know, at this point um, on DFI, do you have any more significant investment that's going to be required to, um, you know, to get, you know, let's say half a dozen systems out in the field? Yeah, you know, from a development standpoint, the majority of the investment is done. There's some incremental investments we're doing on spe specific features. And, you know, there's always a, a level of software investment that's going on, particularly when you look at new applications. 
And, uh, you know, our spend so far recently has been around building or early purchasing of uh, components that we need for deployment of systems uh, at, our, at our core customers. While we're very mindful of the fact that, uh, you know, we've told customers uh, that we, you know, if they were to order, once we run out of the next one or two machines, it will be quite a lead time uh, for them, even if we, we've, or, we've ordered some long lead items as, as well. So, you know, uh, we feel like we're in a good position there as we have a number of companies interested in the next capability and a limited amount of capability out there. Got it. And that's it for me. Thanks so much. Thank you. And there are no more questions on queue. I'm now turning the call over to Mr. Kibarian for closing remarks. Thank you for participating in our queue for call. We look forward to talking with you again soon. Have a great day. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.